Welcome to Swish and Flick, an all Potter podcast. Swish and Flick, everyone. The Swish and Flick. Hello and welcome to episode 66 of Swish and Flick. I'm Tiffany. I'm I, Megan. Oh, I was going to be Megan. I'm Katie. And they say I'm Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> this episode is sponsored by Paisha. So thank you, Paisha, for supporting us. We thank, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, so today we're going to continue our discussion about the Wizarding World in America, Makuza, and Rappaport's Law. Um, side note, this is another weird episode where uh, we couldn't get together to record, so Katie and I are recording our parts alone, and then Sarah and Tiffany gave us their little tidbits in the doc so that we can tell you what they would have said had they been here. Yeah, and I, I have to give a shout out to the other two girls because they did a really good job on the last episode. We have I, a lot to follow up to. Yep, <laughs> makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Um, but I think it worked. I mean, you know, it's not ideal because we would all love to just be together or at least be on Skype. But you know what? Life happens. Thank you, everyone, for understanding. And I really don't think it, it I thought it sounded pretty good. Yeah, I think it's going to be okay. Yeah. Um, all right, so weekly profit for this week is we had an article that was going around in our Facebook group a lot. People were sending it to us about how the Harry Potter films were coming to Netflix in November. Oh, <gasps> no. They are not. No. I didn't um, see this. So they are only coming to Belgium and France. So any Swishers who are in Belgium and France, lucky you. <laughs> you get the Potter films on Netflix, but nobody else does. So I guess the reason why is because, like, the the films are licensed differently in different countries. Um, so, like, we could get them down the road, uh, but... Right now, they've only negotiated with France and Belgium. Uh, Netflix has only negotiated to be able to release them in Belgium and France. So, like, they have to do more negotiating. Also, I think that it has something to do with the conflict of the fact that because they're distributed... Oops. Because they're distributed by Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers typically keeps their films confined to HBO in the UK... And, um, well, they recently just sold them to sold the sci-fi. Oh, well, yeah. sci-fi has them in the U.S. right now. But I think because that deal is, like, still kind of fresh, that's probably why Netflix did not get them for the U.S. Whoa, okay. So you know how ABC Family would always do it? Well, now it's Freeform. Weekends. They would do it for Halloween and Christmas. Are they not going to they not gonna play Harry Potter for Christmas anymore? No, they don't have the rights to it. It's not right. That's not right. Well, I ABC, can't go a Christmas season without turning on Freeform <sighs> and having Harry Potter play. I know. ABC is Disney, so it doesn't really make sense. I mean, it never made sense that they had the rights to them, you know? So, But also, I don't know. Who knows? Sci-fi might do something. True. They'll bring you just to a different channel. Also, I think it's hilarious because, you know, if you're <coughs> listening to this podcast and us, you know, hosting this podcast, we clearly probably all have... Oh, All I know. of it's the just, films. I know. <laughs> but it's just, it's just something, easy. Yeah, it's something about picking up your remote when you're already on the couch and being like, you know what? I'm just going to turn on Harry Potter. When there was that Two brief clicks. period of time where they were on HBO Go, I watched them a lot more because it was just easy to sit down and I didn't have to sit through the whole thing. I could just like click one of them and play it for a little bit and have it be like background noise. Yeah, it was just easy. It was very convenient. <laughs> yeah. Hashtag millennial. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, should I do it? You have to. I mean, you you said in the beginning that you're Tiffany, so. All right, so it's time for the r -r 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 recap. Not bad. Not bad, Tiffany. Fake Tiffany. Fiffany? <laughs> Tiffin. Megany? Megany. Okay, Megany. And I'll be, <laughs> I'll be Sadie. <laughs> All right, so last time, Tiffany and Sarah and us in text form, uh, they talked about the lost colony of Roanoke, the international statute. Statute? I think Is that so. how you say it? I always say it differently in my head when I type it. The international statute of secrecy, the Puritans and the Salem witch trials, the Crucible, Dude, and I a bunch of fun stuff in between. I forgot about the Crucible. Me too, until I read And Sarah's I was like, part. oh, yeah, I read that in mm -hmm. high school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Same. I, you know what? I would like to, like, see it again to, like, 
actually truly appreciate it now, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. So yeah, summary for this episode, as Sarah put in here, Megan and Katie talk about stuff. Do you yeah. want to read Tiffany's notes and I'll read Sarah's notes sure. since you're megan and I'm Sadie? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I dig it. All right. All right. So guys, I'm going to start off talking about Makuza, um, which is the magical... What is it? <laughs> <laughs> what does the A stand for? Oh my I God, always, I'm blanking right now. <laughs> you always just call it Makuza. I know it, but it's like, okay. there we go. Oh, see, yeah, that's why, because it doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. The Magical Congress of the United States of America, or Makuza. It's like the A shouldn't be there, but they right. put it in there to make it easier to say it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a phonetic thing. All right. We are okay. not to be blamed here. America um, messed it up. <laughs> so, Makuza was created in 1693, which I just want to point out is 83 years before the United States of America became a nation. And it was called the Magical Congress of the United States of America. But here's the thing. Was it just named differently back then? You know what I mean? Was it just the Magical Congress for a while? Oh man, this I is don't know. Me off. So it's weird because it says in here the Magical Congress of the United States of America, known to American witches and wizards as Makuza, was created in 1693 following the introduction of the International Statute of Wizarding Secrecy. There is no like previous name, it is just introduced as the Magical Congress of the United States of America, which really throws me off because the US didn't exist. Yeah. Now, could this be a time turner thing? <laughs> Theories. <laughs> Hashtag curse child. Or um, no, I don't know. I, maybe they just knew like what was in the talks of what it was going to be called. Or witches and wizards <laughs> called it that, and then when it came time, that's what they called they were, it. There was a witch or wizard that among said, the people who were like, you know, United States of America it should be the USA. And everyone was like, yes. Or they confronted them to say, yes. <laughs> right. Now that's where we are. So I thought that was weird. That is um, weird. Good catch. So the longing for an underground community was extremely prominent in the U.S. due to the Salem Witch Trials that had just happened. Yeah. Um, so the founding of Makuza at this time makes sense because it's literally right at the it's right at the Salem Witch Trials time. Like, we need to do something to protect ourselves because right. it's getting out of control. Um, so, I'm guessing it was created due to the trials, obviously. Uh, Makuza was modeled after the Wizards Council of Great Britain. Um, and this predated the Ministry of Magic. So, the so Ministry of are. Magic came from the Wizards Council of Great Britain. Got it. Um, Representatives for the council were elected from all over North America. Makuza's primary aim was to rid the continent continent of scorers, uh, which I think maybe Sarah and Tiffany talked about. Yeah, yeah. So those are corrupt wizards who had hunted fellow magical beings for personal gain. So also, these are wizards who fled other countries because they did something illegal or bad, mm. and they came to America because there was no government. So it was like if they came to America, they wouldn't be found. An, a fresh slate. Right. So America was like, well, we want to get rid of these guys <laughs> because clearly it's like we're wizards and witches already had a bad name in America because of the Salem Witch Trials. Like, just like the climate of the area was very intense because of the Salem Witch Trials. So, like, those type of wizards are the last kind that you want roaming America. Right, because they probably don't care about any kind of secrecy or anything like that. They're just... They're the ones that should be burned at the stake, probably. Not necessarily, like, all the ones that were, right? Because, like, they really did do something that possibly warranted either going to Azkaban in Great Britain or you know, some other prison in another country. They're, like, very early Death Eaters. I guess, kind of. You could compare them to that, yeah. Like, the same kind of, just, like, a a bad group of people who has a horrible set of ideals, and they just try to spread it everywhere, and they just, I don't know. (sighs) So, um, that is why Makuza's number one aim, like, their, their 
big thing was law enforcement. So Makuza's second great law enforcement challenge was the number of wizarding... Oh, I just said... That's... Yeah. Wizarding criminals who fled to America from Europe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the first president of Makuza was Josiah Jackson, and he was chosen because he was a warlike wizard who was believed to... Ha- be able to handle a post-Salem witch trials America. So they wanted a tough dude. Right. Right. Um, because, as I said, like, the climate was probably very intense at this time. Honestly, it kind of reminds me very much of, like, what George Washington would have had to go through. Like, who mm. is strong enough to lead the country after a revolutionary war? Well, yeah, like, that was decision. kind of a war on witches and wizards, right? The Salem witch trials. So it's kind of like a good comparison there. Who would be strong enough to lead witches and wizards after such a tragic thing that happened? Um, so in the beginning, Makuza was very concerned with security because of the trials. So they had no specific meeting spot due to the fact that they were scared that they would be discovered. Um, so their first order of business was hiring aurors. That was their number one thing. They wanted law enforcement to be their main thing, to get rid of these scorers, to get rid of these people that came over from other countries who, you know, wanted to get away from lack of organized law enforcement. Um, so that was what Makuza needed to put in place, was organized law enforcement. So Sarah put something in here. Yeah, as, and Sarah said, um, so all these all these aurors that Meg are about to- Meg is about to say, uh, they all volunteered. Mm -hmm. So on Pottermore, it says that they knew they might be required to lay down their lives when they took the job. Yep. Uh, She says it reminds me of the people who joined the military, and I agree. I mean... That's great comparison. That is extreme bravery. I mean, anyone who goes into any kind of law enforcement, I mean, you know that that's... Police. That's a possibility, you know? Military. It's scary. Yeah. So, yeah, it. I mean, that's super, super brave. Yeah. So um, it's it's kind of cool to list off these people because there are a couple names that are important. Mm-hmm. Uh, so first is Wilhelm Fischer. Uh, second, Theodard Fontaine. And Sarah says, I don't know where she finds this stuff. Oh, I guess just on Potter, was, but geez. It was in Potter. Oh, I did okay, see okay. some of these things, but I'm glad that she put them in there because <laughs> I was trying to pare it down. But, like, I guess if all of our voices were talking, it would have all come out. But. True. Okay, here's Sarah. Uh, so, Theodard Fontaine survived into old age. He has a direct descendant that is a headmaster at Ilvermorny, and this is according to yeah. Pottermore. Um, next name is Gondolphus Graves. Now, that name is obviously familiar. Percival Graves is in Fantastic Beasts and works as head of the Aura Department uh, for Makuza in the 20s. So, clearly, this is a family job. Yeah. Because Sarah says remains influential in American wizarding politics. Yep. So, yeah. So, that name um, must be an influential name in America. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robert Grimsditch, Mary Johnsey, Carlos Lopez, Mungo McDuff, Cormac O'Brien, Abraham Potter. What? Excuse me? Uh, so, Abraham Potter is distantly related to Harry. Uh, and it says on Pottermore that, like... They say after, I can't, it said, like, people had fun, like, finding the genealogy matching up, like, after Harry became famous. And they, like, they really, and she's, like, talking about witches and wizards who are obsessed with genealogy, like, in the story. Like, they had fun trying to, like, trace the genealogy back. And um, he is distantly related. So that's kind of cool that, like, so Harry's family clearly was based in Great Britain. We know a lot of his ancestry because it goes back to... Uh, his family's actually really big in potions, right? So that's where they made all of their money. But even earlier than that, possibly, goes back to America. Yeah. So maybe Abraham or parts of his family possibly separated from England, like whenever people migrated over to the Americas, um, they just decided to like start anew over here. Also, I think, um, and I hope I'm not wrong, but in the previous episode with Sarah and Tiffany, I believe that they said that um, the wizarding kind knew of North America way before non-magical people. Well, also the fact that Ilvermorny is rooted in a lot of Native American um, stories. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Uh, Okay. So, Berthild Roche, Helmut Weiss. Charity Wilkinson. Sarah says, third president of of Makuza and survived into old age. So I just want to like, I just want to say about all these names in general, you can tell that this is an American group of people. Mm -hmm. There are names that come from 
all types of backgrounds. Carlos Lopez, um, Mungo Macduff and Cormac O'Brien, clearly mm-hmm. Irish, right? Abraham Potter, we know that to be a British name. Um, Weiss, I'm guessing maybe Polish or something. I mean, like, there's, yeah. there's names from all over the place. So it's just, it matches America, right? Um, so Tiffany also says, it appears as if the auras are a melting pot of people. The last names suggest people from all over the world from different backgrounds. I like it. It's how America's supposed to be. I didn't even read that she put that in there, which is funny. Because <laughs> um, I was going to say that That's awesome. <laughs> to begin with. Um, so America remained for a really long time a hostile environment for wizards. It wasn't helped by the fact that this is one of the only Western countries that didn't work with the Muggle or Nomad government. So literally every other country has a relationship with the Muggle government that they're in. We know this from Harry Potter because Cornelius Fudge and Scrimger Mm -hmm. meet with the prime minister whenever things are happening in the wizarding world, in the books. Um, So that is common. That is how most governments run. They work with the Muggle government. Uh, But America, no. They're totally separate. They do not let the nomad government know that they exist. Um, And honestly, it's for a good reason. They just don't have the trust there yet. Oh, yeah. Um, I can't blame them. I mean, your, yeah. your people are being hanged and right. burned. And-, and it's crazy to think that, like, we're talking right now, like, we're in the 1600s, 1700s, where I'm talking right now. And even in 1920, yes. that's still how it was operated. Almost 1930. I mean, we're right. pushing late 20s in the yeah. Fantastic Beast film. So. The next film is supposed to be in the 30s. Yes. So, like, yeah, who knows? Um, so a little bit about Makuza's headquarters, it moved around a lot because like I said before, they never had a specific place that they met for a long time because they were worried about being discovered. So originally they were located in the Appalachians. Um, however, that was incredibly inconvenient. Mm -hmm. It's far away. It's hard even to operate to because a lot of the stuff looks the same. Mm -hmm. Um, that makes sense. And it's just (laughs) difficult to get there, which was good because they were kept secret, but it also was just kind of a pain for the people who were actually part of Makuza. Um, So in 1760, Makuza moved to Williamsburg, Virginia, and this was their, quote, home uh, while this current sitting president at that time, President Thornton Harkaway, was, was because he, that was his home. So, like, they just kind of moved to where he was. Um, He also bred Krupp's which are a magical being, magical creature. They're dog-like creatures that look exactly like Jack Russell Terriers, except they have a forked tail. Um, I find this really funny because if you think about it, so my aunt, uh, my aunt and my cousins have always had Jack Russell Terriers. So I'm like familiar with like what they look like and how they are and everything. Uh, Terriers in general are can be aggressive, not, like, just towards people, but, like, they're hunters, they look for animals, they bring you presents (laughs) at the door of animals that they may catch and or harm, um, such as mice and rabbits and, you know, (laughs) and their tails are always cut. Their tails are, whenever they're puppies, they always cut Jack Russell Terrier's tails to be a little nub, which I find funny because that is right where the forked tail would happen. So, theoretically, we could have crops running around everywhere right now, and we would never know because they cut their tails. Right. Um, they're hi- also, so crops specifically, are also highly aggressive towards non-magic people. Uh, his pet crops killed no magis. Which caused him to leave the office of president. That's sad. Yeah. That's sad. And also just kind of like, I mean, that's their relationship with, with no matches, you know? It just like is ingraining that in people's minds. Like, oh, even the president's dogs killed no matches. Like, we're just not friends, you know right. what I mean? That's a good point. Um, so after that, Makuza relocated to Baltimore, where President Abel Fleming had his home. But... That was whenever the Revolutionary War broke out, followed by the arrival of the Nomad Congress in the city. It made Makuza pretty nervous, and they departed for what is now known as Washington. So 
Tiffany here says, I need to know the deets on wizards and how much they're involved in the revolutionary and civil wars. Like, I need it so much. I know. I, I agree. Know. Like, and I, I wonder how much in America they did. Because, like, I guess they could have helped maybe for benefit to themselves. But do you really think at this point with the climate of the relationship between nomages and witches and wizards that they would want to help the nomages in their war? Right. Like, at the time, it almost feels like it'd be like... Almost like a survival of the fittest. Like, well, right. we have magic, like, well, so, you know, like, we're, we're going to keep to our kind, you keep to your kind. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like witches and wizards definitely helped in the world wars. They did. Yeah. But I can't, I, I just don't know about them helping with the revolutionary and civil war. Maybe the civil war, because, well, no, even then, because, like, like I said, still in the 20s, they were operating just as they are now. Not really interacting with the government at all or anything and yeah. they were pretty they pretty much just kept to themselves i'm sorry tiff but i think i'm gonna go with that they didn't really help that much then i know they did help in the world wars but but did american wizards help in the world war i don't know no i think so did they yeah i think i'll talk about it later okay good <laughs> So, next up is President Elizabeth McGillicuddy. <laughs> uh, awesome name. <laughs> so, she's a pretty important president in Makusa history. She presided over the infamous country or kind debate of 1777. Oh, there we go. Um, so, thousands of witches and wizards from all over America came to Makusa to attend this meeting, for which the Great Meeting Chamber had to be magically enlarged because so many people were interested in this conversation. Uh, so, the, the issue for discussion was, did the magical community owe their highest allegiance to the country in which they made their homes or to the global underground wizarding community? Uh, so, they morally obliged to join... Were they? Oh, were they morally obliged to join American nomages in their fight for liberation from the British muggles? Or was this, simply put, not their fight? Um, so this conversation got really heated. And uh, here's where I'm going to say that... Sorry, I'm reading Sarah's notes. Um, pretty much I was, uh, I was right. They didn't really help that much. Yeah. So pro-interventionists argue that they might be able to save lives, but anti-interventionists that wiz said that wizards risked their own security by revealing themselves in battle. Oh, yeah. Which makes sense because they would be vulnerable if they didn't use magic. They're not trained to fight the way that the nomages are trained to fight. Um a four-word... Okay, so messengers were sent to the Ministry of Magic in London to ask whether they intended to fight because they... Like, they are the same people, right? But I guess, like, so are us in Britain, like, Great Britain. But they wanted to know, hey, are you going to come over here and fight for London? We want to know. A four-word message was returned saying, sitting this one out. So even the wizards and witches in London didn't fight yeah. the Revolutionary but War. But see, they had more reason not to because... You know, they they Did weren't they really part of the people who were about, like, I'm breaking away. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So McGillicuddy's response was famous and even shorter and just said, mind you do. <laughs> So officially, the American witches and wizards did not engage in battle. However, there were some instances of intervention to protect, like, nomad wiz uh, neighbors and wizarding communities celebrated Independence Day along with the rest of American society, although not necessarily alongside them. See, that means that, you know, there's, there's good in humanity everywhere, even in the wizarding kind. So even when they're oppressed and everything, some of them were like... Well, I'm I just going to throw this protection yeah. charm around their house so like, that they don't get injured or, yeah. It wasn't in the books. And again, I'm reading Harry Potter all over again, which is amazing. Wasn't there, like, something put out there where they were like, help protect your muggle uh, neighbors, like, throw a protection so. over their house or something. So that's kind of cool that it calls back to this, too. Yeah. Sarah's. Oh, Sarah says, I really like the idea of the wizards helping out when they could. It is their country as well. Um, just for reference, as Tiffany and I talked about last episode, the Declaration of Independence was first signed in July 1776. And in October of 1781, the war virtually ended. And two years later, the Treaty of Paris was signed by the Americans and British, and America was independent. Sweet. Yes. 
So yeah, like as cool as it would have been to like see them in war together, I think that if you want to get that information, Tiff, you probably just have to look for the world wars because it seems as if both sides sat this one out. Yeah. So Katie is going to talk about Rappaport's law here shortly. However, I want to just touch on a little bit about it. So, um... Makuza enforced total segregation of the wizarding community and nomages, and intermarriage and even friendship became illegal in America in 1790 with Rappaport's Law. Uh, so, just for, you know, brief little info there, Makuza remained in Washington until 1892 until there was a breach of security. Uh, there was an uprising of the Sasquatch, Bigfoot, and What? Anyone? Uh, population and their arrival into Washington caused mass obliviations and extensive repairs to headquarters. And Sarah has notes. Sarah says this was blamed on Ire- Irene Kneedander, <laughs> who allegedly attacked any Sasquatch that stepped out of line. Quote. So Sarah says she sounds a lot like Umbridge. Yeah. Like, why are you working in a field you hate? Uh, I wonder if there was anyone in her department that called her out or tried to be helpful to the Sasquatches. I'm sure there was. I would hope so, but, like, honestly, yeah, if you don't enjoy your job, please don't work that job. And Tiffany like says, that. up with the sas- up with the Squatches, actually. <laughs> um, so it was then that Makuza took to New York. And the Woolworth building is where Makuza is, and it is both a nomad and magical person's building. So cool. Uh, the only outer marking of Makuza was a carved owl over the entrance. It's a real building, right? It is a real building in New York. It's amazing. So... Um, It is on Broadway Street in Manhattan, designed by architect Cass Gilbert and constructed in 1910 and 1912, and is considered an early U.S. skyscraper. Wow, Um, so according to Fantastic Beasts, like, this is still a really new building for Pretty new. Yeah. Yeah. So the original site for the building was purchased by F.W. Woolworth and his real estate agent in 1910. Um... Purchased for $1.65 million. That's a lot back then. Uh, so by January of 1911, Woolworth had acquired the final site for the project, and it totaled $4.5 million. In 1910. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it remains at 792 feet, one of the 100 tallest buildings in the U.S. Awesome. As well as one of the 30 tallest buildings in New York City. Can we talk about that for a second? That means... So it's in the top 100 tallest buildings in the U.S. and only in the top 30 of tallest buildings in New York City. So New York City has over 30 buildings on the 100 tallest buildings list in the U.S. That's nuts. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, Also, it has been a national historic landmark since 1966 and a New York City landmark since 1983. Can we go see this? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yes. Um... Quickly, I wanted to try and see what is in there right now. Yeah, like what is it function? The muggle side. I'm sorry. No match. Oh, tenants. Here we go. At the building's completion, the FW Woolworth Company occupied only one and a half floors of the building. But as the owner profited from renting space out to others, did he know he was renting it to Makuza? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, did someone? <laughs> no, I don't think so. It was Disney? like it was like um, it was just a spell thing where like literally the entire building became Makuza's. Depending, you know, I mean, so well, we was... saw how it works. Whenever Tina enters the building, it was yeah, no which one has is cool. to know. So, um, it was rented out to the Irving National Exchange Bank and Columbia Records. So Columbia Records moved into the building in 1913 and housed a recording studio in it. In 1917, Columbia made what are considered the first jazz recordings by the original Dixieland jazz band in the studio. During World World War II, the Kellex Corporation, which is part of the Manhattan Project to develop nuclear weapons, was based here. Jeez. So... 
I also just want to say on the Wikipedia page in popular culture under film, it does say in the movie Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, the magical Congress of the United States of America is concealed from nomad view inside the building itself. That's some pretty impressive magic, though. Yeah. Like, awesome. It was also in The Great Gatsby. And Enchanted. Enchanted. (laughs) Spider-Man 2. So it's many a very cool famous building. It is. It's cool. <sighs> we'll have to go and see it when we're in New York. I really want to. Uh, Sarah says, I like that it has a giant clock that measures the magical exposure threat level. It reminds me of Molly's clock, and it could also be anxiety-inducing inducing like a doomsday clock. And Tiffany says, yes. But yeah, honestly, I love that. And we when we went on, uh, when we went to Leavesden, Mm-hmm. They had, like, a miniature scale of it. It was really cool to see. Oh, the clock? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was tiny, but yeah. <laughs> it was really cool. And I have socks that have it on it. Yeah. I think that it's kind of interesting that they use a clock for that. Because to me, like, that seems, I, I don't know, it just, like, doesn't seem like a an American way. That's, like, too complicated for us Americans. You know what I mean? What should it be? I don't know. Just, like, a like a bar graph. Just well, tell me you know what the what? threat level is. Like, if you think about the airport, I was just where it say. says, like, green is good, red. But I guess the colors are on the clock, so, like, it kind of makes sense. Maybe they just incorporated it all because we're a melting pot. Yeah. So they're like, oh, clock, if you want to look at it this way. Colors, if you want to look at it that way. <laughs> How fast it's spinning, if you want to look at it that way. I mean, I was gonna, I was going to say, speaking of airports, like, I mean... We have a very dimmed down version of this for threat levels at airports. I remember like taking flights and it being like the threat levels at orange, and it was like, oh, oh my, my gosh, God. yeah, I know. I, I can't remember. That was like it was it was further back towards like nine eleven, whenever yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. that. But but it's scary. So like, imagine you know, I mean, we see it in Fantastic Beasts. It's up there. That like, came. I'm pretty sure that that threat level came from nine eleven. I don't. Oh, I don't it, it think did. that we had that before. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. I don't think we had that before 9 Probably not. I mean, a lot of airports and stuff changed. Yeah, I know. A it's lot. just, it's, I can relate, you know, of, let, of being, like, worried. And, like, they're experiencing a lot of this during the Fantastic Beasts era movie because, you know, we have Credence running around like he's some crazy creature ripping up the streets. It also, uh, I also find it interesting that they have something that measures magical exposure threat in general because, like... You know, the wizarding world that we know the best is Great Britain's, right? Yeah. And, like, while they seem to care about, you know, like, so, like, I'm rereading Goblet of Fire right now because we're about to start it. So, I was at the, I'm at the part where... um, I was at the Quidditch World Cup. (laughs) I was at the Quidditch World Cup. And they were talking about all of the measures that they took to make sure that the muggles didn't notice that all of these wizards and witches were gathering for the... Quidditch World Cup, and, like, they cared, but they didn't. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, you know, they go to the campsite, and the guy who's running it is so confused. They just keep coming by every, like, half hour to obliviate him. And it's like, well, first of all, you're, like, making this guy's mind fuzzy (laughs) for, for, like, how many days? Because, honestly, you don't know how many days people are going to stay there because the cup could go on forever. It could go on for days. Plus, early tickets had to be, you had to be there, like, two weeks earlier. Right. So, I mean, he's going to get suspicious. And, like, they take measures to prevent it, but at the same time... Eh. Eh. (laughs) And then, like, when Ireland wins, Mr. Wheezy is like, Mr. Wheezy. Mr. (laughs) Weasley is like, oh, I'm so glad that I'm off duty. I wouldn't want to be the one to tell the Irish they have to stop celebrating. But, like, do they really even go tell them to stop celebrating? You know, I mean, like, that would be like, that would be like the Cavs and Warriors in the baseball, or in the, the, oh my God, what is wrong with me today? In the basketball (laughs) NBA finals. And, like, when Cleveland finally won, telling Cleveland to stop celebrating. Right. Like, regardless, it's not going to happen. Yeah, it doesn't matter what sports team. You can't. It doesn't matter if you're magical or not. (laughs) Right. Like, you're going to celebrate because you love the team. Yep. So. um, Okay, so a very brief little bit on Makuza in the 20s. We're still learning. The Department of Magical Law Enforcement is the largest department at Makuza because, as I said, that was, like, what they were founded on. So even into the 20s, this is still true. 
Uh, Rappaport's law was still in operation in the 20s, as I stated before, which means that you can have no intermarriage, no friendship, no communication with no matches. So, well, not necessarily no communication, but you have to keep it minimal and you have to keep it brief. Yeah. You cannot befriend them. Um, so, also... I find this interesting. It's kind of, it's it's weird to see how different places punish people for their wrongdoings. Um, so in the UK, as we know, they would send people to Azkaban. Uh, however, in America, for its worst criminals, they just executed. Oh, there was, see that. There was no, uh, there was no option to. Jeez. So. Jeez. However, yeah, Sarah says... Would you rather just die or suffer an Azkaban? Which do you think is worse? She says, I think I would rather just be dead, super morbid. (laughs) Tiffany just said, uh... (laughs) But honestly, that's a question, you know? This is kind of, uh, like, not to get political or anything, but, like, this is kind of a comparison to, like, capital punishment. Yeah, it's a direct comparison. And are you... You know, there's, like, all these comparisons about, like, oh, which one costs us more money, keeping people in prison for life or executing them. Um, And I feel like for a long time, capital punishment was just, like, the number one thing, even in Great Britain. I mean, if you look back to, like, Tower of London and everything, execution was just, like, you know, I mean, like, the laws and stuff weren't as protecting to the person who committed the crime as right. they are now, right. especially in America. You didn't really have a chance to... Like, right. There was, yeah. like, the trials were not as fair as they are now. Um, yeah. Totally different. Yeah. Well, that's Makuza. And like Katie said, we're still learning. Uh, we're probably going to get a boatload more Makuza information in just a couple weeks. Yeah. And so years and years later, like we're we're probably not. I mean, honestly, I don't know if I could say we're ever going to know everything that there is to know about Makuza because I just have a feeling that she's not done after Fantastic Beasts. Like I know that she's still got three movies to go after this, but there's other stories to be told. Whether it's Newt or a different character, possibly we delve into Marauders. Marauders. <laughs> hey Joe, the Marauders. <laughs> Hey, do you want to tell me why I should like James? <laughs> I, think, I think you should. <laughs> yeah, honestly. All right. My turn. You've been listening to Meg this whole time. I know. Now you're going to listen to me. No. We're in the yellow. You I'm have to listen talk. to me anyway because you're my wife. So. <sighs> Sorry. So we're still kind of on Makusa. Actually, we're totally on Makusa. Okay. So in 1790, <laughs> Emily Rappaport. That's who I was thinking. Yes. Yeah, she is the 15th president of Makusa. Uh, she instituted the law that Meg was talking about. So Rappaport's law is total segregation between wizards and nomages. So this happened because what? This it also. She literally. I don't know if you heard it. She was ooh, 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 and raised her hand. <laughs> <laughs> this also, uh, I think, is a direct comparison and super reminds me of segregation in America between blacks and whites. Yeah. So. Just throwing yeah, that out there. Right. Except, well, I mean, 1920s, it was still going on in America, too. So That's true. it's. It was just like the whole climate. Like, it's right. a bad setup for. Just not it is stuff. crazy to think that how short a yeah. period of time it is that that was still going on. Yeah. Like my mom was alive. That's a, that like, that mind. is one generation away. One generation away experienced segregation from us. I want to shout out to. Uh, like our generation and younger. I always get the names mixed up. But for only being one and two generations away, I think we're headed into the correct mindset when it comes to things like that. So I'm proud of all of us. Yeah. Shout out. Shout out to us. Shout out to us. We're awesome. <laughs> okay. And <so. laughs> this is totally off topic. Bring it. But this is coming out. The weekend before Election Day, and I am not voicing any opinions. I am just saying, please go out and vote your opinion. Exercise your right. Exercise your right as an American. If you are an American, I'm sorry that if you're not, and I'm taking this little two seconds here of a soapbox to say it, but please just go vote. 
your voice matters. Your vote has influence. Vote your heart. Do it. Go and vote. Mm-hmm. I'm wearing my sticker right now. I don't now. care what you vote for. Just vote because you should vote. It's a right to, as an American. So please do it. Yep. Because that's how segregation stopped. It's true. It's how a lot of things stopped and started in America. So I wonder how Rappaport's law stopped. I don't know. Because I'm assuming it did. But maybe it hasn't. Maybe it hasn't. We don't know. I bet it has. But we don't know. It's true. I bet it has, but we don't because know. Because I, well, I mean, yeah, I don't know, but I think that the reason, well, I'm not going to do any Grindelwald spoilers, <laughs> so never mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's for a future topic, yeah. <laughs> a future uh, episode. So, Rappaport's Law came into being uh, yeah. because of the daughter of the president's keeper of treasure and dragons. So the dragot, 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 mm-hmm. dragot, is the American wizarding, like currency person, basically the treasurer, like galleons, yeah. sickles, and nuts. Yeah, it's similar to the secretary of the treasury. Yep. So in America, so that guy's daughter, no good. Her name's Dorcas Twelve Trees. Does she get a bell every time I say her name? Uh, I don't know. She is a piece of work. <laughs> no. She, uh, so she was a student at Overmorning, but she was a very poor student. Not poor money-wise, she just wasn't a good student. Um, she didn't study, folks. She didn't study. She didn't do her homework, and she didn't show up at class, which is what everybody should do. <laughs> okay, Hermione, calm down over here. <laughs> so uh, she was a student at Overmorning during the time of her father ascending higher in his office. Yeah. And she was living at home. Um, so she hardly ever performed magic, and she was mostly just focused on her appearance and her clothes. So she didn't really care that she had these powers or whatever. Um, and she ended up becoming infatuated with a handsome nomad named Bartholomew Barebone. What? And I know Tiffany and Sarah did touch on this too. Barebone. Gotta be related, because... That makes sense. Yeah. Was he a, a scour? Yes. Okay, so again, scours are rebel wizards who fled to America to avoid getting caught in their own country due to the lack of governance in America back in the day. For more information, listen to Sarah and Tiffany's episode. So, no one in his family was magic, but he believed that all witchers... <laughs> witchers? <laughs> Witches and wizards. He believed they were all evil. Even beautiful Dorcas? Yes. <laughs> Do you want to read Sarah's? Because I've been talking. Do you think that Dorcas is like a play on doofus? Oh, I don't know, but I'm going to get to something sort of into that. Okay. So Sarah says, I wonder if some of the last names um, are Native American. I wonder with some of the last names if they are Native American. Uh, also, Dorcas reminds me of Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Great movie. Again, Sarah, we don't know your references, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be Sarah going. You've never seen that, <laughs> and then one of our listeners is gonna be like, Sarah, I got you. <laughs> I've seen it. Because <laughs> uh, they always do, and I love it. So Dorcas gave this bare bones guy Bartholomew information that could harm the wizarding community. What a doofus! <laughs> what a Dorcas! Uh, so he got. She gave him the addresses for Makuza mm-hmm. and for Ilvermorny. Yep. And info on the International Confederation of Wizards Why? and all the ways in which these places protected themselves and concealed themselves from the nomadges. Yeah, let's pause for a moment of silence there because why? Why would you do this? What would make you give that information to somebody that well, I mean, like I guess you're in love with him. I was but just like say that. Wouldn't that be, like, a warning bell? Like, why is he so interested in this information? Unless she was just hopeful that, you know, I don't know. But Maybe she again, just needed somebody to talk to, so, like, she just yes, talked? because she doesn't care that she's magical, it seems. She doesn't act like she cares, so she, she is just spewing this stuff out. Maybe she just, like, doesn't understand how confidential that information is. Your dad and not works only at that, Lisa. But, like, why would her dad give her that information that's another question oh yeah you know like it's just weird there's a lot at fault here a lot of people at fault um so bartholomew then stole dorcas's wand and gathered armed friends to persecute and kill all the witches and wizards in the vicinity so this guy is no good uh he was excited to set his plan into motion he got so excited 
he shot at a group of people who he thought were Makuza wizards. Turns out it was a group of nomadges. Thankfully, no one was killed. That's lucky. Yeah, but he was arrested and imprisoned for the crime um, without any involvement from Makuza. So the nomadges were the like, nomads you shot into these it. people. Yeah, um, so they didn't have to deal with it at all. Uh, but Barth- Bartholomew gave all the information he got from Dorcas out to so many people. He was just spewing it all over the place. Um, that a few newspapers actually took the info seriously enough to print pictures of Dorcas's wand, and it said in there that it would kick you if you waved it. Well. So, following, like, all this Salem witch trial stuff, like, things just aren't good. Yeah. For the wizarding wizarding community. community, Yeah. So, Makuza was obviously forced to move because of this breach of security. So, President Rappaport had to tell the International Confederation of Wizards... At a public inquiry, she had to admit that there's no way that we know for sure that we have, like, obliviated obliviated every single person that Dorcas's information got to. Yeah. There's no way to know. Um, And it obviously would be a problem for many years because, say, someone knew it, didn't really want to tell anybody because they thought that they'd be crazy, but then 20 years down the line, they're like, I got this story. You won't believe what happened to me. And then it sparks again like fire, you know? So many people wanted Dorcas killed or imprisoned for life, especially at this time, because execution was numero uno. Um, But she got one year in jail. I kind of don't agree with this, because she just exposed the magical community in a horrible way. You get one year in jail? She was given one year in jail, but Newt and Tina were given execution. Yes! Yes! (laughs) Maybe because her dad's high up. I I, don't know. I am assuming, absolutely, that that's what it is. And (sighs) she was a kid yeah but at the same time that is a huge thing to have done and like i guess i understand that you can't fix stupid <laughs> <laughs> like that was just stupid it was right it was dumb it was dumb but like that one i mean i don't know one year in jail it just doesn't seem right no it doesn't, yeah, with how, how they are just, like, very, they seem very impulsive. Right. Uh, American wizards, at, at least at this time. So it That's just, a good descriptory word yeah. for America. It just doesn't make sense. I'm assuming it's because her dad's. Yeah, um, probably. Public figure. Um, so because of all this, that's why Rappaport's Law was created. So wizards could no longer marry or even befriend a nomad. Um, the penalties were super harsh as were well. Were they execution? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I don't know. know. <laughs> Maybe just one year in jail. Yeah. Um, Tiffany? Tiffany says, this hurts my heart. What if you're in love? Yeah. Well, Queenie and Jacob. And I have a feeling that we're going to see how they deal with that in the next film. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that. I think that might lead... Maybe that that's what leads to us finding out what breaks Rappaport's law if it does break. You know? Yeah. Maybe this starts something. It's all because of Queenie's love. Yes. I love Queenie. Me too. Queenie's love. I love Queenie. So Rappaport's law is one of the big things that sets America apart from Europe. And they are very we know different. this specifically because of Newt as well. Do you remember in the film how he's like... Um, he says it to Tina and how he like can't believe the relationship that no mages and oh, witches yeah. and wizards have in America. Like he's just kind of dumbfounded by the law. Like, why is this a thing? I was gonna say that, like, we see we see like um now that I know like how big of a deal it is, we see how like urgent Tina is. Like yeah. the no mage. Non magic person, like, what did you do with him? Did you right. obliviate him? Like, tell me you did. And Newt's just kind of like, what's the eh, big deal? Like, it's fine. Everyone's who gonna cares? Think it's crazy. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. But Tina, yeah, she's like, oh, plus because she's an aura from Kuza, and as yeah. we know, that is their like number one thing there. So she's got to be on it, or she's out. She's already out at that point, you know, because of her previous mistakes. But yeah, it, it her urgency makes sense upon learning this information, the history behind it and everything. Yeah. So it makes more sense now. We're about to get in trouble. 
but we're going to get there. So <laughs> in the old world, in Europe, there had always been cooperation between governments. Meg, I think you touched on this. So Makuza, though, acted independently from the nomad government. No communication with them whatsoever. Uh, so Rappaport's law pushed the, co- the wizarding community even deeper underground than ever before. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you want to read Sarah's thing? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about this the whole episode. So uh, Sarah says that we see the law repealed in 1965. So actually after the entirety of the Fantastic Beast series. So during the entire Fantastic Beast series, this law is still in effect. So never mind. We're not going to see with Queenie and Jacob yeah, in the we're movies. Not. Uh, but as I said in the last episode... It reminded me of segregation and interracial marriage, which I also stated. Um, In 1967, interracial marriage was struck down by the Supreme Court in the case of Loving versus Virginia. I love the idea that Joe makes things coincide with real life events. Do you know what I also love is that she always makes the Wizarding World one step ahead of of the of the uh, non magic world. Also, two years before. Interracial marriage is struck down. Segregation is struck down in Do you Makusa. think there was ever any kind of... Also, sorry, guys. We did not read Sarah and Tiffany's notes because I wanted to be surprised in the episode. So thanks, Sarah, for answering our question. Yeah, and I, sw- <laughs> I listened to half the our episode so we wouldn't step on toes, and this is obviously in the part I didn't listen to because <laughs> I didn't get to it. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that was a long episode. But it was awesome. Oh, I'm not saying it wasn't. Yeah. But, yeah. I was going to say something. Oh, no. Oh, I was going to say, do you think that there was segregation in the Wizarding World for, like, like, like interracial? interracial? Yeah. Do you think? I'm going to um, say no. No, I don't think so, because if you look at Serafina, Serafina yeah. she's Again, president. Step ahead. Yeah. Go Wizarding community. But you know what? In as many ways as they're ahead, they're behind, too. So, I know. like, both, both yeah. sides are, yeah. you know... Give and take. Give but and take. usually, you know, like this example, usually the wizarding, like, look, the wizarding world created Makuza before the United States was even a thing. <laughs> that was 83 years before. Can we talk about how everything's older than the United States? <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to move on to 1920s wizarding America. Okay. Or the American wizard. So, the American wizards did play their part in the Great War, slash World War I, of 1914 to 1918, even if the Nomadges had no idea. So, I don't know how they did this, you know? Like, how were they... (laughs) That's a lot. I don't know. Like, how were they careful, or, like, was their role mostly protective of the nomad fighters i don't know maybe they infiltrated like the infirmary infirmaries too to like heal people better yeah yeah like uh, yeah i bet that would help a lot i know i like that had canon accepted <laughs> um so there are magical factions on both sides but they won many victories in preventing additional loss of life and defeating their magical enemies so there we go they did protect people <laughs> <laughs> and you know there's gonna be just like with any portion of humanity, there's going to be people on one side and people on another side. So it's, it does not, it's not different with uh, magical folk. So there was still no softening on Makuza's stance on the nomad wizard separation. Fraternization. Yes. <laughs> Rappaport's law was still firmly in place. Um, so by the 1920s, American wizards were kind of used to this extreme secrecy. Unlike European wizards, because as we said a couple times in this episode, they're just kind of like, it's important, but like, it's eh. not. <laughs> we'll just fix it. It's fine. fine. I mean, like, if you think about, like, whenever Voldemort was defeated, right? Like, they... <laughs> they almost blew it. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, the news and stuff was reporting shooting stars mm-hmm. and uh, an obscene amount of owls during the day. Everyone's in their and, robes. Like. <laughs> yeah. Uncle Vernon runs into Daedalus Diggle, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Oh god, I, I someone draw that for me. I love requesting Uncle little Vernon. drawings. Yes. Uncle Vernon meeting Daedalus. Yes. <laughs> oh, um, did he re- De- meet Daedalus, or did he Harry met, just run into him? I Harry think. did see him, but I'm assuming I would I would accept it again as headcanon that that's who he ran into too, because that'd be extra cool. Some funny bloke in robes. <laughs> um. So American wizards were also used to selecting. Uh, their mates strictly from within their own ranks. So, 
Again, no contact really at all. So I'm going to save that for a lightning round, actually. So never mind. Pure bloods? No. Oh, I was going to ask how blood status was in America, but go ahead. That's a good lightning pull around question. Yeah. So Makuza uh, imposed severe penalties on anyone who decided to just openly disregard the statue of secrecy. Um, and there was also much, they were also much less tolerant of like ghosts, poltergeists, and magical creatures than European wizards because if those get out, that's a really big like, hey, there's <laughs> magic in the world. So it's really going to expose them. To, or expose no magic to the existence of magic. We shut that guy down months ago. <laughs> um, so, fun fact, back to Dorcas 12 Trees um, and her catastrophic breach of the Statutes of Secrecy. That secrecy. she got one year in jail for. Right. Such a harsh punishment. Poor you, Dorcas. Um, the slang word Dorcas came about, meaning an idiot or inept person. And when I read Dorcas 12 Trees, I was like, huh. <laughs> Her name's Dorcas. And then I kept reading and I was like, oh. (laughs) She's why. She's why. She is a Dorcas. Um, And Sarah says, oh, ha, ha, that's kind of sad. (laughs) (laughs) And Tiffany says, what about Dorcas 13 trees? Tiffany, that sounds like a joke I would make and I super appreciate (laughs) it. What about Dorcas 12 sticks? Oh, my God. Keep going. (laughs) So, (laughs) Katie just laughs at her own joke. (laughs) By the 20s, Ilvermorny School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, which I kind of think is like, I wanted to have a different name. Like, it's Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. I want it to be like Ilvermorny School of, like, Excellence and Magic or something. You know what I mean? Like, something different. I kind of am falling in love with Ilvermorny. I want to know more because I know I will love it. Guys, I I think that's what's coming. I think that we're going to get more on Ilvermorny. I don't know if it'll be in book form or if it'll be a movie or a TV show or something, but I think we're going to get Ilvermorny. I hope so. I hope so. Um, so the school had been flourishing for more than two centuries at this point, and it was widely considered to be, to be one of the greatest magical educational establishments in the world. Hogwash. Clearly behind Hogwarts. Right. I mean, come on. I know I'm American, but like, I would be... <laughs> What is that called? I do study abroad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, also, all witches and wizards were proficient in the use of a wand. I feel like they're super wand-oriented. I feel like Europe is kind of half and half. And then we know that, I think it's, is it African wizards? Like, no wand. Don't use wand. They yeah. don't need it. That's just how they did things. Um. Sarah says, we'll also discuss this more when we talk about Ilvermorny in an upcoming episode, but they don't get their wands until they're at school. They get sorted into their house and then get their wand. That's cool. Oh, she also said in the previous episode, and I don't know if you heard it, she said, um, if you're at Ilvermorny, you can't take your wand home for summer break. You leave it there, which I think is, like, smart. (laughs) Again, I bet you that has to do with the statute of secrecy, though, because if you have young wizards who are, like, going to be rebellious, (laughs) right? I mean, honestly. No, I just read that part in Goblet of Fire where that little kid's like, you bust slug. You bust slug. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. How many times I have to tell you not to play with daddy's wand? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Oh, yeah. But I I bet you that's why it plays into, again, Rappaport's Law. Oh, for sure. It seems like everything American wizardry, unfortunately, revolves around Rappaport's law. Yeah, it revolves around like we need to protect ourselves because we've we've witnessed a lot of horrible things to our kind. It's just it's <sighs> yeah. protection, you know. It's really sad. So, at the end of the nineteenth century, legis- legislation was passed that required every member of the magical community to carry a wand permit. So we see this in Fantastic Beasts, and I'm going to get this, get to this a little bit later because I want to cover what we're going to cover in a little second, and then I'll get back to it. So remember, wand permit. So this was meant to keep tabs on all magical activity and to identify perpetrators by their wands. So again, because it's very serious over in America that we don't mess up, we keep it a secret. Um, so in Britain, there's Ollivander's wands, considered unbeatable. Yeah, you've got Grigorovich, but like you always hear about Ollivander, like... Who cares Top. about Grigorovich? <laughs> um, but America, North America, had four great wand makers. So we had Shakoba Wolf. She's of Choctaw descent. 
And she was famous for, like, intri- intricately carved wands that contained Thunderbird tail feathers. And I like that Thunderbirds are, like, considered the American Phoenix. It mm-hmm. makes me even more proud that I am a Thunderbird. Thank you very much. Um, so her wands, I'm, ass- I'm thinking it's a girl. I don't know. Wolf wands were generally extremely powerful, but were very difficult to master. And they're particularly prized by, like, transfiguration masters. Tiffany says, I wonder if wolf can transform into a wolf. Is wolf a werewolf? I think that that would be known. That'd be awesome. Would, is our werewolves allowed in America? Oh. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I wonder if, because they're considered magical creatures and humans, so I know that they were super strict with their creature laws. I just am curious. I need to know. Yeah. I need to know. Well, isn't a rogaru kind of like a werewolf? And rogarus are in America. I'm getting to that. Okay. That's so funny. It's so funny. It's like you're reading my mind before I get there. It's like we're married. <laughs> um, so another wand maker. Is that Johan? Is that how you would say that? Yeah, maybe. Johan. Jonker? I'm going to say Yonker because I'm doing a silent <laughs> J. Um, so he was a muggle-born Who's no magic father? Wait, no magic born? How does that work in America? Because they're not allowed to have relationships with no magis. I bet you they have to like sign something, the parents and them, or something like or that. Or they came over from Britain. I guess. So, like, they are Still. muggles, but they come over and now they're no magis? Still. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so, his dad was a famous cabinet maker. Tiffany says. Vanishing cabinet? Oh, no, no. Um, so, Yonker wands were highly sought after and usually inlaid with mother of pearl. I wonder, oh, Queenie. Yeah, I wonder if it's Queenie's. And Newt. On the inside. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. I bet you both of their wands are made by them. Jonker, Yonker. <laughs> Johan Jonker. <laughs> um, and he preferred the core to be the hair of the wampus cat. <gasps> I want it. <laughs> Um, so the next, the third wand maker is Thiago Quintana. So these were sleek and usually lengthy wands, and each was encased with a single translucent spine from the back of the White River Monsters of Arkansas, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and they produced spells of force and elegance. So there was a fear for a little bit of like overfishing of the White River Monsters, which I don't really why, know why the people in America cared if they're all like. We don't like magical creatures because they're going to yeah. expose us. I'm glad they did. But. but at the same time, they have to leave some because, like, like you know, you can see here, you use those resources. Potions. And, yeah. You know, everything. Unless um, they import everything. But, heck, that'd be expensive. Uh, yeah, maybe eventually. But when you first come over, um, you got to get that stuff yourself. Yeah. Uh, but it was soon uh, proven that Quintana himself was the only one who knew the secret of luring these river monsters and he kept that secret until his death so afterwards like you those kinds of wands aren't made anymore it's crazy so i actually have a link here from animal planet what (laughs) right i was so excited because i looked it up and i was like animal planet yes so yeah the is ugly the white river monster just for funsies Uh, Begins in the town of Newport in northeastern Arkansas, or as I like to say, Arkansas, because why do you have an S if it's a W sound? (laughs) I don't know. Um, So in 1915, local farmers began filing reports of this large unknown creature off the banks of the White River. Um, They describe it as having gray skin and looking as wide as a car and three cars long. So how many wands can you get out of one? Oh, man. How long is their spine? (laughs) You could just cut Three it up. Three cars until- long. <laughs> I'm going to guess it's like 36 feet. Oh, that's crazy. No, it's got to be more. I don't know. I'm really bad. Someone's going to laugh at me because that probably makes zero sense. Um, and other probably people. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's like be like 30 feet. <laughs> uh, long. We'll just say long. <laughs> um, other people described it uh, that it looked like a large sturgeon. Excuse me. Or catfish. So the monster like. Started getting sighted again in the summer of 1971, so really not that long ago. And people described it as the size of a boxcar with a bone protruding from its forehead. Ew. So, yeah. So some people think that 
it's kind of just like mistaken identity. Apparently there's there's a what am I thinking of? A career called a crypt cryptozoologist. Awesome. Wish I would have discovered this like way earlier in life because I'd love to be one. Um, I think they just do these weird like legends and stuff. I don't know. That'd be cool. Yeah. So they think that it was mistaken for a male elephant seal. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. And like the bone on the forehead could be like their inflatable trunk that they have. So that's what they think. But who knows? I believe in you, White River Monsters. All right, so last last wand maker is Violetta Bouvet. Yeah, it's pretty good. So she's from New Orleans. She made New Orleans. Her, New Orleans. She New made Orleans. New Orleans. She made her wands out of swamp mayhaw wood, and she refused for a long time to tell anybody about the core of her wands. But it was eventually discovered it was the hair of the Rogaru. The Dig dangerous it. dog-headed monster from the Louisiana swamps. And I'll get to them in a minute, too. Uh, it was often said that Bouvet, Bouvet? How did I say it? Bouvet. One Bouvet. took to dark magic like a vi- vampire took to blood. But a lot of American heroes in the 20s went into battle with it. Um, and President Serafina Pickery herself has one of these ones. But do we know if she's good or bad yet? We don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So, the Rogaru, Louisiana's Cajun werewolf. What? Right? The Rogaru, also known as the Loop Garou, which I think is French for it is werewolf. for werewolf. And it sounds super cute and adorable. Loop Garou. Loop Garou. Um, Sorry if that was really bad, guys. <laughs> it is essentially Louisiana's bayou dwelling werewolf and is a prominent figure in Cajun folklore. Um, it's also, so it's described as having a human body with the head of a wolf or dog with glowing red eyes and razor sharp teeth. Um, also, there's variations of it being like a pig or a cow or a chicken if it's like in an area where wolves aren't seen, which I think is kind of weird. But you ever hear of a were chicken? No. <laughs> so it's often associated with the skunk ape or the honey island swamp monster. So it's got a couple different names. Interesting. Yeah. And of course, anything having to do with a werewolf, I'm just like, yes. Give me all the info. <laughs> so last fun fact. Um, unlike the nomad community of the 1920s, Makuza did not partake in prohibition. <laughs> so they allowed witches and wizards to drink alcohol. And many people pointed out, look, if you're in a city full of sober nomadges, probably going to look weird that there's a couple magical folk who are a little... A little uh, on the bottle, yeah. So, um, and I just quoted this straight from Pottermore because I loved it so much. However, in one of her rare lighthearted moments, President Pickery was heard to say that being a wizard in America was already hard enough. Quote, the giggle water, as she famously told her chief of staff, is (laughs) (laughs) non-negotiable. So, I mean, I mean, look at that. Like, the president's like, nope, it's hard being a wizard here. Yeah. Let us have a little bit of something. You got to give us something. Yeah. Sarah says, I think it's really interesting to see the difference between uh, European wizards versus American wizards and muggles versus nomadges. Europe seems more relaxed in both parties versus Americans. We can see it in their laws. Exactly. Which is true. I mean, if you just like super basic things that I can think of right off the top of my head, like the drinking age is lower in Europe than America. Um, I don't know. It's just more like, it's more like It's lax. just more lax. Yeah, it's more, it's, but if you think, I guess maybe you think about it, like, Britain is so old. Like, it's so rooted. Like they that Maybe have, they've already gone through this stuff and they've, they've already come out of together. it. Here's America who's, we're, babies. we're a baby in the world of history. Yeah. History of the world. I don't know. <laughs> so, like, we had to go through all of that and still, like, very fresh. Yeah. Yeah. Tiffany also adds, do you think that during Prohibition, the wizards would secretly get alcohol to no matches? <laughs> like, I'm they- going to headcanon that as a yes. <laughs> they make money a- off of it. Oh, yeah. You have a nomad neighbor, and you're like, hey, come over here for a card game. Yeah. And then you're like, here, have this. And they take it, and they're like, bah! What's this? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, hold on. So when was Prohibition? In the 20s? Mm-hmm. 
So did Jacob get giggle water and like oh, Jacob, you lawbreaker? <laughs> he was like, "Yes, a secret wizarding bar getting my drink on." <laughs> We're looking it up right now. 1920 to 1933 it was prohibition. Oh, Jacob. So yeah, Jacob breaking the laws. Jacob. All right, that's the end of my section. Lightning bolt round, if I can remember what I wanted to say. Oh, there was oh, one no. I wanted to... Oh, okay, so how do you think that Rappaport's law affected blood status in America? Not blood status as in, like, who's better and who's not, but, like, do you think that there were more pure bloods in America than other places because you could only match with another witch or wizard? I mean, I guess it depends on who came over, you right. know? I know somewhere, and I hope I'm not doing this wrong, but I believe America has more muggle-borns. muggle-borns. Which was, okay, yeah, yeah, which was weird to me. Like, how is that a thing? I, I just, I just don't know. I wanted to know, I don't know if I asked this. I think I asked this in the last episode. It's probably the part that I didn't get to. I'm sorry, guys, I failed. But, like, I wanted to know if, um, does that mean that there is more um, obscurus yeah. In America, because it might not be, like, if there's not as many witches and wizards as there are in over in the in Europe, because that's where everyone has lived and, again, is so rooted, and then only a handful, compared to the rest of the population, come over to America, if suddenly these magical kids are, like, appearing and their parents don't know and there's no one there to tell them about it, unless Ilvermorny does a very good job, as Hogwarts does, if they don't know and then, like, this kid's like, I gotta hide this... And then they end up, you know, not making it because they think there's something wrong with them. They're trying to hide their magic. I don't know. Yeah. Lots to think. Did any of that make sense? I feel mm-hmm. like I was kind of rambling. Oh, wait, I'm not done. Your wand permit? Yes. I was just about to ask oh you Oh, my about God. That. Okay. So, back to the wand permit because I wanted to go over all of the wand makers. I'm sorry. Also, I think I have horrible coffee breath and I'm right in your face. It's okay. So do I. I don't that think you do, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I love you. So, you can... I'll post a link to the wand permit that you can buy from Mina Lima's um, website because you can, like, blow it up and see it, which is really cool. But I had never, like... Like, oh, cool, a wand permit. That's neat. But I had never, like, looked it. at it. And after doing this research... So, on the front, it says, Application for wand permit. With Makuza's seal. Right. So you open it, and uh, it says application for wand permit. There's an application number. It wants to know if you're right or left-handed. Uh, it puts You have to put all your legal wizard names. Um, there is a Makuza identification number, or if alien citizen, import your alien registration number. It wants your profession, um, like your address, and then wand information, so length width. Yeah. It wants, like, the dimensions. It even asks for, like, if there's a special decoration, uh, detail on the shape and the color. There's a little section to check off what type of wood it is. This is so detailed, it's, like, blowing my mind, and I don't know if I'm excited because, <laughs> like, I'm a designer. No, it's but, cool. Um, there's, like, a place for... Wand core. Ooh, look at all these cores. Yeah. Oh, look, look, look. Phoenix. Look! Oh my god, it's blowing my mind! <laughs> Phoenix feather, dragon heart string, unicorn hair, vela hair, thestral tail hair, nasal whisker, troll whisker, kelpie hair, wampus cat hair, thunderbird tail feathers, rogaroo hair, white river monster back spine. So, like, okay, so obviously Mina Lima's in cahoots with Joe. Oh, and look, it even Mina wants Lima. to know who made it. Yes, it has all the wand makers on here. Garrick, Ollivander, Gregovich, and then mm-hmm. two that you can write in. Yeah. And it wants to know if it's, like, an imported wand or from the USA. Uh, it wants spells, spells most, most cast in the last five months. So Detailed it, information is required. Any misleading, misleading or false information will result in prosecution and imprisonment. It's just, like, in this... I mean, how tiny is this piece of paper? It's smaller than a piece of letter paper. Yeah. In this, you can get the feel of the, like, anxiety and the yeah. seriousness that America takes in keeping... Magic quiet. All information given here will be checked against Makuza's central wand archive. It's crazy. Like I high this I have this physical piece from the book The Case of Beasts Explore the Film Wizardry of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And it's the one that like looks like Newt's suitcase. Like you can open it. Um 
Highly recommend because it has a ton of cool stuff in here like this. And this is in the back of it. Um, just looking at this like, oh my god, it gives me all those excited Harry Potter feels. I can't handle it. <laughs> so, like, side note here. So, like, you can feel the anxiety going to fill this thing out. And it says here, attention, you must carry your permit at all times. Failure to show your permit will result in imprisonment, prosecution, and wand confiscation. Newt doesn't care. He doesn't have this when he's over there. He, what is she? She Nina said, do asks. you have your wand permit? And he said, well, I submitted one, but blah, 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 and just, yeah. like, trails off. So, like, you can tell how lax he is and how much he doesn't really seem to care or even understand the severity of it. But then, like, Tina kind of lets it go. She doesn't really seem to care. But it says here, like, there's three wand permits, and I'm, it's, I'm guessing that this is similar to, like, a passport mm -hmm. where you have to get permission from Makuza to have your wand in the country. You know it's what I mean? So like, like are it you says, responsible enough to be a magical being in America? Yeah. It says here you have to have a wand registration number given to you with a date of like when it is issued and expires and a signature and then your signature of signature of permit holder. These are really cool though. Oh my god. Only use green ink to fill this form. <laughs> How funny is that? Like, when you write out forms for the yeah. government, it's like, blue or black ink only. Green ink only. <laughs> it says here, date, location, moon, Venus, Mars, officer in charge. I think it wants, like, the location of the moon, Venus, and Mars whenever you do this. Whoa. I bet you it's just to, like, really double check, like, the time and dates are correct. Guys, I don't know if anybody found that as exciting as we did, but that was awesome. really cool. And that's just one piece of paper in this book I have. Right. I want to see what else is in there. Ton of stuff. Ton of stuff. I can't remember. Did I ask my lightning bolt round question? Oh, mine so. was going to be, um, do you think there was interracial segregation? That was my lightning bolt round question. I don't think there was. Yeah, I agree. And then we talked about how, oh, it's a step ahead. Always. Always. Yeah, this book is full of stuff. It's got, like, identification cards for Makuza employees. Anything else to add before we uh, move on to our fan story? Tina's address is 679 West 24th Street in New York, if anybody wants to go visit her. <laughs> Always alone, Mrs. Esposito. <laughs> Always alone. Tina, you got company? <laughs> We're flipping through the book right now. Um, I think this was really fun. This was Tiffany and Sarah's idea to and do. I dig it. Yeah, and let I us, dig it. Like, be on, be honest. Let us let us know. Like, give us feedback on these episodes if you liked this little break of like some different stuff. Right. Because we would love. I mean, this only enriches our knowledge of the Wizarding World, which is like that's one of the big reasons. Personally, I wanted to do Swish and Flick because. Yeah, I know Harry Potter. I live and breathe it. But there's a lot I don't know. Because there's a lot there's a lot out there you don't realize is out there and there's a lot to speculate and like think on and just elaborate on and wonder and it's amazing. That was this. You gonna put it back. Yeah. It's just it blows my mind and I enjoyed doing extra research like this and learning about you know, why, especially in the time we're in now with the Fantastic Beast movies coming out, learning, like, why they were so serious about nomad relationships and all that. Although, I will lightning bolt this. Why is it, like, if they're so serious about nomad relationships, blah, 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 at the end of the movie, they're, like, not really, like, they're, like, okay, you know the rules, you gotta obliviate them. Like, I feel like they would be, like, freaking out. Like, at watch... New like, watch to make sure it happens. That, yeah, like, just very serious. I think serious. that it's probably because they have Tina there as an official of Makuza, possibly. She's, like, putting trust in Tina. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Just thoughts to think. <sighs> yeah. All right, is it time for our fan story? Yeah. I almost feel like I shouldn't read it because I've been talking. Do you want me to read it? We can change Would it up. Would you like to do the fan story? This sure. Week? All right. I'll do it. 
So our fan story this week comes from Jordan. Um, uh, so it says, hey, everybody. My name is Jordan, or fan girly on the internet. I'm a very proud Hufflepuff. My Patronus is a bat. How cool. That is cool. And my wand is 11 and 1 fourth inches, English oak with unicorn hair, and slightly springy. I actually don't remember how I got into Harry Potter. I was eight when the first movie came out, and my dad probably took me to see it as he read all the books up to that point. We ended up buying it on VHS, yes. and my little sister was only one at the time and was entranced by it and would stop crying if we put it on. <laughs> Same for when the second movie came out, so we had Harry Potter running at least once a day. I remember trying to read the first book several times, but I've never had the focus for reading. I could read short books like Goosebumps, but I can probably count all the novels I've ever actually read on my fingers. In college, when I was finally when I finally got into the books because I could listen to the audiobooks on YouTube while doing art, and when I graduated, my older sister threw me a Harry Potter themed party. Sadly, I only found books one through five on YouTube, uh, so it wouldn't be until recently I finished the last two books on Audible. Crazy. I actually found your podcast because I had just finished Deathly Hollows but still wanted more Potter. I think it was about two weeks ago that I found the podcast and got completely caught up. I just want to say thanks for the podcast because it is nice to hear others as enthusiastic as I am for something I love. That right there is why I love Swish and Flick. Yes. <laughs> like we just did this because we wanted to continue to be enthusiastic about something we love. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we can share that with others is just really awesome. Also, Jordan, I relate to you because my dad got me into Harry Potter. Not because you read the books, but he's like, Kate, let's just go see this movie. Because I was like, no, it's not cool. Everybody it's likes It's mainstream. It. Yeah. Um, trying to be hipster before it was hipster, you know? But, uh, but I owe it to him because then I saw it and I fell in love. And I love that you were able to find a way to enjoy the series. Because you know what? Some of us aren't visual learners that way you some know, of us we'll are audio, audio. Yeah. exactly so i love that you found a way to do it and it it's awesome that like you just finished it like a year and a half ago <laughs> yeah oh man or whenever you sent this in i don't know maybe you just found us after either way it's cool crazy oh yeah you're right i don't know what i'm thinking no it's okay just i don't know when they sent their potter story in you know true um, okay, so Swish and Flick Podcast can be found on all of the different social media channels. We are Swish and Flick Podcast on Facebook and Swish Flick Cast on Twitter and Instagram. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube at Swish and Flick Podcast. All of our podcasts are posted there as well as vlogs, including Puff Pastry coming this weekend. So... You can so, uh, <laughs> some high promises. <laughs> no, I promised our patrons it was going to come out this week, so it's I happening. I have faith in you. Um, you can also join us on Patreon for exclusive access to the Felix Files, our bi-monthly bonus episodes. Uh, you can also choose a level to be a guest on the Felix Files. You can join us for our live Zoom chats every month. You can be eligible for giveaways. It's a lot of fun over there. Cool so. giveaways, guys. Cool yeah, we actually giveaways. like we legit give away cool stuff. Not to, like, you know, toot our own horns. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> you can find us on at patreon.com forward slash swish flick cast and choose your support level. Thank you to all of our current patrons. And all our listeners. We appreciate you all. We so thank you. you. Um, lastly, you can check out and find all of that information on our website, which is swishflickcast.com. Also, merch is there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we want to plug other projects? Sure. Okay, guys. So, I know that for months and months and months, we've been talking about our trip to England Wait, and Scotland. Did we take a trip? And Iceland for a day. <laughs> and Disneyland Paris for a day. So... I told myself I cannot start editing vlogs of our trip until I put out puff pastry, which is <laughs> why I'm forcing myself to finally finish it this weekend, because I'm hoping starting next week, we will be having weekly vlogs of our trip on Main Street 9 and 3 quarters. So go and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Main Street 9 and 3 quarters. And you will see our entire trip. Because we're ready to relive it. And we're also going to be putting out podcasts 
about planning for it, about our itinerary and how each part went and what we did and what we liked and what we didn't like. Because you know us, me and Meg, we like to talk. We can talk about this stuff for a very long time. So go subscribe to us on YouTube, Main Street Nine and Three Quarters. Look for a video next week. Yep. Oh man, who's gonna do this? Oh, you do it. You said I did you were the Megan. Okay. Do you want to split it? Yeah. Okay. Which one do you want? <laughs> that <Yes>. silence. <laughs> that concludes this week's episode. Thank you so much for listening. And, and don't, don't let, let the muggles, muggles get you down. down.